Uh, my name is Steve Kyle. I'm an elder here at the Way Fellowship. I have the privilege of sharing God's Word with you today. And we're in, as Tom mentioned, the last chapter of 1 Peter. We will be continuing into 2 Peter next week, so I encourage you to read ahead. But we'll be here this week. Um, if you need a Bible, raise your hand if you would. Jim Ross will give you one if you want a printed Bible. And uh, thank you for coming this morning. We appreciate you taking the time to be with us. Um, deciding that worship and fellowship and learning from God's Word was important to you. So let's pray before we get into God's Word, shall we? Heavenly Father, we thank you for, more than anything, Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your presence with us, for your goodness in allowing us to meet, for giving us another day to live, for providing a place, and especially for the, the precious uh, sacrifice of your Son. We thank you for, again, your presence with us here, that you are instructing each of us, working in each of us, to hold up your end of the bargain, so to speak, that Philippians 2, 12, and 13 talk about, that you're working in us to willing to do. We make a decision, and you then can change our hearts. Uh, we thank you for that being advanced just a little bit this morning. Thank you for your word and for, for your enlightenment. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. So we're going to jump right in, I think, and read 1 Peter chapter 5. So let's do that. Oh, I did one while you're turning there. Um, my wife and I had a chance to go to the youth function yesterday. Young adults? Dakota Young Adults, right? Anyway, it was fantastic. Yes, exactly. And... It, it, and, and here's, here's why for me anyway. It is um, the process of what the Shema, Deuteronomy 6, talks about. Uh, these words which I command you this day shall be in thine heart. You will talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. It is the process of godliness being transmitted to the next generation. There are few things in the church that are more exciting than that. To see these 10, 15, 18, whatever year old people excited about godliness. Because, ladies and gents, we'll just simply say that doesn't happen enough in our church, in the church in the United States, and in our society. So it was fantastic. It was outstanding. Just outstanding. Okay, let's, uh, so let's read First Peter chapter 5. <clears throat> and uh, Peter writes there, The elders who are among you I exhort... I, who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed, shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion but willingly, not for dishonest gain but eagerly, not as being lords over those entrusted to you but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. By Silvanus our faithful brother, as I consider him, I have written to you briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God in which you stand. She who is in Babylon, elect together with you, greets you, and so does Mark, my son. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace to you all who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. So there's three sort of main topics in this chapter. One is, he talks about elders. He talks about meekness, humbleness. And he talks about uh, the devil. And we're going to look at those three things. But before we do, let's talk a little bit about Peter when he, in light of the fact that he, he brings in here that he was a witness of the sufferings of Christ. 
So let's look at, uh, we're going to look at Mark chapter 26. Before we even do that, he talks about that he was a witness of the sufferings. But just remember the other things that Peter witnessed. Um, and now, when he writes this, it's about maybe 35 years later, after the things that he experienced when, during Christ's earthly ministry, when they actually occurred. But just think about some of the things that he could have, you know, sort of pulled rank on. Like, um, he was there with the feeding of the 5,000. You know, he was there when he was the only one of the 12 that actually got out of the boat and walked on water. He was there when the 12-year-old son of the... Um, uh, the ruler of the synagogue was raised from the dead, and he, Jesus comes in that record in Mark chapter 5. Jesus brings Peter, James, and John in with him into the room where the little girl, the 12-year-old, is actually there. Everybody else is outside, right? After everybody outside laughs him to scorn because he says, why are you mourning her? She's not dead. She's sleeping. So they laugh at him. He takes those three in, and then he says, Talitha Kumai, damsel arise. And then he says, make sure she gets something to eat. <laughs> Have the presence of mind, after raising somebody from the dead, make sure you give her something to eat, guys. Peter was there. He was in the inner circle. He saw these things. Now, we're going to talk about the sufferings too, but think about the things he saw, which would have enabled him to say a lot more than, I'm a fellow elder. He could have said, you know what? I walked on the water. You're going to do what I say. But he didn't say that. Let's look at Mark 26. I'm sorry, Matthew 26. And more of the actual, the sufferings that he witnessed. And we're just going to read these things. We've read these before. I think it was in the context of Hebrews 12. I read these with you. But when we read these, I want you to pay attention to how Peter is specifically involved. Because Peter is a dynamic player in these things. The other apostles, the other disciples are there, but Peter's a dy dynamic player. So let's just read Matthew 26, 36 to 45. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, Sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Now, so he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane, there's only 11 apostles here, right? Because Judas is already going to betray him. Judas is going to show up here in a few minutes, and he's going to say, friend, you know, and he's going to kiss him, and he's going to betray him. So he's not going to be there, but there's 11 with him. So he leaves eight of them. He takes these three with him, and he goes over and says, wait here with me while I go over there and pray. And look how Jesus is now. At one point he says, he was sorrowful unto death. Do you think Peter remembers this? Do you remember significant events in your life that happened a long time ago that changed your life? Do you remember those? Do you think this was probably pretty clear to Peter? <laughs> he remembers how Jesus looked before he was going to go through all this stuff? <clears throat> Let's keep reading. And then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. Stay here and watch with me. Keep that in mind. He went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, and, and I've talked about this before, but when he fell on his face, this is, he's flat out on the ground, like here, you know, before God, completely helpless. Peter sees this. He sees the sufferings. He's a witness to this stuff. You couldn't get any closer than Peter was. <clears throat> Keep reading. And I don't know that he heard Jesus pray. I don't know about that. But he went a little farther, fell on his face, prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Do you think Peter remembered that 35 years later? <laughs> Pretty sure he did. Pretty sure that didn't go away. Again, a second time. Whoops. Uh, yeah. Again, a second time. He went away and prayed, saying, "Oh, my Father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done." And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. So he left them, went away again, and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to his disciples and said to them. 
Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. You couldn't get any closer than Peter was to what was happening here. So when he says he was a witness of the sufferings of Christ, it's not like he had to, you know, ask somebody what happened. He, was, he had a front row seat, guys. <laughs> let's, uh, let's read. I want to look at John 13, too. And Joel brought this up last week in the context of, of service and how our service should be. This is the record of Jesus Christ washing their feet. But I want to, again, I want you to pay attention to Peter's specific role. But I also want to call attention to one thing that happened just before this. <laughs> and if you, um, I, in the notes that are online, I listed the parallel passages in the Gospels for this John 13 record. Because John 13, there's, there's a couple of details that the John 13 portion doesn't, suggest, doesn't say. So just before Jesus, you know, after the meal, he, he wraps himself in a towel, he gets down with a bowl of water, he washes their feet, he dries them with a towel, right? Just before that, just before that, look at Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. Now there was also a dispute. This happened right before John 13, guys, right before, okay? Now there was also a dispute among them as to which of them should be considered the greatest, Let's continue reading, but then we're going to jump over to the parallel in Mark chapter 10. And when the ten, this, James and John apparently were the instigators of this, okay? So James and John kind of, and even though it doesn't say Peter was rooting for himself, Peter was right in there with him. Please remember, whenever we read about Peter anywhere, he's always, um, I've heard him described as, um, instead of ready, aim, fire, it's ready, fire, aim. <laughs> really, he speaks first. And we'll see that here, actually. He speaks first. And then he thinks. And that's really Peter. So was he involved in who's the greatest? Doesn't say he was. Guessing he probably was. Let's keep reading. <laughs> We're in uh, Mark chapter 10 now. And when the ten heard it, they began to be greatly displeased with James and John, but Jesus called them to himself and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them. Remember that phrase, because that phrase comes up in 1 Peter chapter 5, lord it over them. And their great ones exercise authority over them, yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant." And whoever of you desires to be first shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Um, let's continue. So, so this happens right before Jesus shows them the greatest act of service he could by washing their feet, by performing that menial task, as we've talked about before. Just before then, they're like, Nah, he likes me more. I'm better than you. What do you? You are not better than me. That's what the disciples are talking about just before John 13, just before that record. And remember John 13 through 17 are the last things we hear Jesus Christ say and do before he goes to the Gethsemane, before he's betrayed, before the tortures, before the crucifixion, before all that stuff. John 13 through 17 are the last things he does and says. Let's look at um, John 13 again. And again, just, just keep in mind, we're looking at this stuff because Peter brings up the fact in 1 Peter chapter 5, I was a witness of the sufferings. I was there, first row seat. Right? Let's read uh, John 13. It says there, he rose, this is referring to Jesus Christ, rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter. And Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Which is an indication of how menial this task really was. You're not going to do this to me. I should be doing this to you. You're not going to do this to me. Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. 
Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Remember? Ready, fire, aim. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said, Lord, not my feet, hands and head, everything, the whole thing. So then in uh, explaining more of what he did, Jesus goes on a little later in the chapter, verses 12 and four, through 14. So when he, Jesus, had washed their feet, taken his garments and sat down again, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Again, these are some of the things that when Peter says, I was a witness, these are some of the things he's talking about. I mean, he was there for the tortures, right? Said he was standing on the courtyard, that's when he denied Christ three times. You know, they come up to him, you know, you talk like him. I think you are with him. He witnessed all that stuff. Front row seat. (laughs) Um, So I wanted to bring that up simply because it informs being able to read 1 Peter 5 and, and the background that Peter brings to this. And when he says, fellow elder, he didn't have to say that. He is truly, he learned the lesson of John 13. He learned the lesson of washing feet. He understood that no matter what he'd seen, gone through, walk on the water, whatever it was, it didn't entitle him to be any better than anybody else. He was a fellow elder. The next, um, again, of the three kind of major topics he talks about here in this chapter, the first one is elders. And in uh, verse 2, when it says, shepherd the flock of God, I just simply wanted to make a point of saying that um, so, so human beings, people, Christian believers, you know, believers, are likened in Scripture many times to sheep. Um, and there's different records that say this, but in Luke 15, one of the ones I looked up, you know, there's a record of Jesus Christ himself is saying, teaching them, and he says, which man of you, if you have 100 sheep and you lose one, are going to leave 99 and you're going to go find the one? You're going to do that, right? So the sheep are helpless enough that <laughs> that one sheep is not going to find his way back. Another instance is uh, Psalm 23. You know, David is saying, um, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. So the food thing had to be easy for sheep. (laughs) They weren't going to work hard for it. He leadeth me beside still waters. Couldn't be too rough, they wouldn't drink. Sheep were essentially sort of helpless. Kind of like we are, sort of, maybe which is why we're likened to sheep in the first place. So the first thing he says in 1 Peter chapter 5 is, shepherd the flock of God. Simply want to point out, the flock, the whole flock, needs shepherding. I mean, we need elders to oversee, and we'll see some more of that later. We need elders to, to be in front, to be an example, and hopefully that they are aggressive in their Christian walk and they're moving toward that next step of discipleship. We'll talk about that too. But that is needed. That's not, uh, it's, it's not uh, superfluous. And then uh, the other things here, shepherd the flock, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly. We're in 1 Peter 5, 2. Not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. Not as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. So he doesn't talk about elders having to have a certain social position. He doesn't say, no, they really should have a good job, maybe have a little money in the bank so they don't look like they're shady. They should be upstanding in the community. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say it here. Paul doesn't say it in 1 Timothy chapter 3. Paul doesn't say it in Titus chapter 1 when he talks about elders and their characteristics. He talks about quality of character. It, he talks about a man who, as an elder, who has progressed in his Christian walk into the next step of discipleship, such that he's going to be responsible in leadership. Other people are going to look at him and understand what Christianity means. He's a Christian. I can tell by the way he acts. That's all he's talking about here. But he's not talking about standing in the community. He's not talking about income. He doesn't talk about that stuff. He talks about 
What does the life look like? What does his life look like? How does he conduct himself? And uh, this, in particular, I think it's uh, when you talk about not for dishonest gain, I you just want to point out that it's um, so frequently are we distracted by money. I mean, they were in the early church too. We see it all the time, unfortunately, now in the American church, you know, in the United States. Um, they're, they're in it for the money, guys, whether it's a private jet plane or a mansion or a big church or whatever it is, a uh, big TV ministry, I, whatever it is, they're in it for the money. Not, they're not washing your feet. They're washing their own. Really, I mean, that's what's happening. And the same thing was happening 30 years after Jesus walked on the earth and was resurrected from the dead. Same thing was happening. And then this, uh, we talked about the elders being examples. Um, um, this word, examples to the flock in verse 3, but being examples to the flock. Let's look at, uh, to look at this word examples a little more. Let's look at John chapter 20, verse 25. So this Greek word, I'll let you know, because there's a similar English word um, and it'll be easy for you to remember. It's the Greek word tupos. Okay? And we get directly get the English word type from this Greek word tupos. So in John 20, 25, we'll see what this, um, what this means. Let's read here. The other disciples therefore said to him, and this is to Thomas. They're speaking to Thomas. This is the you know, the doubting Thomas thing. We have seen the Lord. And the way this reads in Greek, it's, um, so there's, you know, the disciples are all there and Thomas comes in. And the way it reads in Greek, it's all 10 of them all at once are again and again, we saw the Lord, we saw the Lord. That's how the narrative really reads. Let's go on and we'll see what this word means. So he said to them, unless I see in his hands the print of the nails. That word print is this Greek word tupos like we see in 1 Peter 5 when it says the elders are supposed to be examples, right? It's, the, it's this word tupos, and what it really means is imprint. In other words, when they took his, it was probably here, but when they took the, looked more like a railroad spike, really, and not just a nail like we would think of a nail, and they put it through his wrist, there was an imprint. There was something left there. And from the way the disciples here are telling Thomas, the other disciples saw the imprint because he says, you know, unless I see it and I put my finger in it, I'm not going to believe it. So the other disciples apparently did. But that's what the word tupos means. It means imprint. That's what, the other way that it's used, so that the way that they made coins in the ancient world uh, was not with big machines like we do now. They would take um, a stamp, you know, that had the mold of what they wanted on the coin, and that mold was called a tupos. And then they would take a piece of soft metal and they would whack it with a hammer on the metal and it would make that imprint in the metal. The impression and the stamp both were called a tupos. And the reason I point that out is in 1 Peter 5, that's what the elders are supposed to be to those whom they shepherd. They're supposed to be the imprint. This is what it looks like. This is what it looks like. This is what you're supposed to do. And they're supposed to do it from an attitude of washing their feet, not of, I walked on the water and you better do what I say. Oh, the other, uh, just wanted to mention one other thing about being examples to the flock. Um, the word therefore being, the Greek word therefore being is the word becoming. That is to say, simply point out, it's a process. We never get to the point <laughs> that we are there, you know, that we are the example. It is always, we'll talk about the fact that elders are, we'll talk, just, just think about discipleship in your life or in my life. There's always a next step. Could we, um, could we put that graphic up there? Okay, so <laughs> let's talk about this a minute, right? So, and the point here is that everybody who becomes a Christian 
when they first become a Christian, they're baby Christians, right? Nobody's an elder when they first believe in Jesus. You're not there. You're a baby, right? You're, and you're going to grow in your faith. It's not unlike athletics. So this is Simone Biles. I think that's, yes, Simone Biles. So, and she's the, I think, acknowledged generally as the greatest gymnast in the world, perhaps the sport has ever seen, but um, uh, Orna can talk about that. <laughs> anyway, and or her daughters. Um, so this is Simone Biles on the balance beam. This little gizmo right here, that's a balance beam. You know how wide that beam is? It's a little bit less than four inches wide. Now the reason I point this out is, when she took her first gymnast lesson, she didn't do this. It took a lot of time. It took consistent discipline. She had to do certain things probably for years to get to the point of this, doing a backflip and landing on a four-inch beam and not killing herself. It's no different than a baby Christian. I, you know, you don't, you don't believe in Jesus Christ the first day and, okay, I'm going to be a pastor now. <laughs> really? No way. So the other, this is a total sidelight. So I wrestled in high school. I was participated in wrestling in high school. And part of our training was we had to, there was a rope. It was a gym like this. So there was a rope that went up to the beam. And part of what we had to do every day of practice, we had to climb the rope three times. So you climb the rope and you climb the rope and you climb the rope and you just do it every day. So I still do that. I still try to practice what I preach as a PT. I exercise, you know, three times a week. My son writes the workouts. Um, and I'll do what he says, but just as a warm-up, there's a little rope where I go, where I, where I exercise, so I'll climb the rope five times. I climb the rope. But I use my legs, okay? And here's why I point that out. You can look this up on the web if you want to. If you type in picture of Simone Biles climbing the rope. So I, I can't show you that. I can only show you this with a chair. Okay, so you'll see Simone Biles, you know, the rope's going up like that, and her, her legs are out like this. And she's climbing the rope all the way up, like that. Now, the reason I point that out is she challenged her boyfriend at the time, I guess. He was an NFL football player. He challenged, she challenged him to climb the rope. Guess what he's doing? Over there struggling with his legs. And she's going with her feet straight out like this, going right up the rope. Now, the point being, she didn't do that when she started, guys. The first day she came into gymnastics, they didn't say, okay, climb the rope with your legs straight out. No. Any more than... The reason I point all this out is, you know, um, 1 Timothy 3 talks about elders and deacons. Ephesians 4.11 talks about apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. The church needs elders and deacons. The church needs apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. The point being, you might be one of those guys. What is the next step in your discipleship? There's always a next step. For Simone Biles, there's a trainer saying, okay, you could climb the rope with your legs this time. Let's see if you can do it without them. Let's try just climbing the rope. Just use your arms. Just see if you can get up a few feet. Do you think that happened all at once? No, it didn't happen all at once. And this is just what you do with kids. Kids don't come out of the box and they know everything. And, they're, you know, that doesn't happen. It takes what? I... Um, the human neurological system, I think, doesn't... There's, so there's, a, <laughs> there's insulation around nerves in the human body. It's called a myelin sheath. And in order for nerves to really work like they're supposed to, that myelin sheath has to be fully developed. And it's in your brain, too. So the, the point being that... <laughs> this may explain somewhat why adolescents are not always making a lot of good sense. Because it doesn't fully myelinate until about the mid-twenties. No kidding. The point being, it's a process. It's a process. Whether you're talking about training the kids, or you're talking about actual physical development, or you're talking about Simone Biles climbing the rope, or you're talking about you being an elder or a deacon or serving in women's ministry and teaching, or whatever it is, it's a process. What is the next step? There's always going to be... I, I enjoyed Joel bringing up that... Um, it's, a, it's always, a, if you will, you know, kind of a dance between you and the Lord. God is always going to be working in you to willing to do His good pleasure. And it's your responsibility to respond to that. 
It's always Philippians 2, 12, and 13. He's always working in you. It's your job to respond. You make the decision. As you make those decisions, he changes the heart. It's always that for everybody. God is an individual God. He isn't working with the whole group, I mean, at one time. He's working with each individual. We'll see that the devil does the same thing. But let's go on. So the next uh, major topic here of, in 1 Peter 5 is humbleness. And let's just look at a couple of things um, regarding that, this word humbleness. Again, the first scripture I want to look at is in Matthew 26. Because this is, again, something that, this is, this is talking, this is Jesus talking to Peter, okay? Matthew 26, 53 and 54. This is Peter, you know, this is when they come in and they arrest him. He's betrayed. And then Peter takes the sword. We know this from John 18. He specifically, John says, Peter did it, right? Yeah. Peter takes a sword, whacks off the ear of Malchus, the high priest's servant. Just cuts it off. And Jesus heals it. He puts, he puts it back on there and he heals it, right? But this is what he says to Peter. Or do you think that I cannot now pray to my father and he will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels, which is about 72,000, by the way, if you're counting. How then could the scriptures be fulfilled that it must happen thus? Now, why did I read that scripture? Very simply, it demonstrated to Peter, Jesus Christ subjugated his will to God's. He was humble. And that's really what humbleness means. You subjugate your will, your desire, to what God wants. That's exactly what Jesus Christ did and taught him by example. Not only did, not only did he not call for the 12 legions of angels, he healed the guy that was, was nailed, got nailed, that Peter nailed. Just healed him. So he demonstrates this by the way he acts. Let's look at uh, Philippians chapter 2, verse 8. And I just say this only because it's, um, it attests to what Jesus Christ was willing to go through for us. And being found in appearance as a man, this is referring to Jesus, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. We've talked about what crucifixion meant. We've talked about the fact that Rome, as a, uh, the ruling government, used it as a tool of terror. I mean, they would crucify it not because somebody did something wrong, not because that's what they deserve, not because it was a punishment, just because they wanted to make sure whatever it was didn't happen again, and if you do, that's what's going to happen to you. So Jesus would have seen that his whole life. The other apostles, they would have seen that their whole lives. So that's why Philippians 2.8 can say, even the death of the cross, because of the shame, because of the pain, because of the ordeal of what crucifixion was and what that meant. <clears throat> now let's go on to the other thing that I thought about with Simone uh, Biles with that picture as well, but um, the whole idea of humbleness, of subjecting our will to God's, again, which is really what humbleness means, subjecting our will to God's. I thought about how many times you know, somebody like Simone Biles came to practice and didn't want to practice. Um, didn't want to do all that stuff that would require her to, that she would be required to do in order to achieve what she achieved. Just an example. It reminded me of 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 27, which are just fantastic verses. But let's, let's read them together. This is, and, and this whole athletic analogy, one of the reasons I brought this up is that this is what Paul talks about here in 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27, because this was familiar to the Corinthians. They were, there are modern Olympic games, which I think started in, I kind of restarted in 1896, were, what they were was the Greek games that we kind of resurrected and started in modern times. So the Corinthians were very familiar with the whole athletic analogy. This communicated to them a lot like it does to us today. I mean, athletics is a big deal. This communicates. So let's look at 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run? but one receives the prize. Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now, he's using an analogy. But when you're a Christian, being temperate in all things means there are going to be times when you have to subject your will to what God wants, that you're going to have to not do something that you want to do because God says don't do that. Or you're going to have to do something you don't want to do because God says do that. There's going to be those times, just like there is for an athlete, just like he talks about here. Mm, let's go on. 
temperate in all things. Now they it, do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. So the, so the perishable crown that this refers to, that 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27 refers to, you know, kind of when they, when they won the Olympics, so to speak, their crown, their prize, was um, a, um, a wreath of parsley. How many know what parsley is? And you know that you garnish dishes with that, like you, you know, brings out, and it's got this really pretty green parsley all over it. It really looks good, right? Did you ever look at the parsley the next morning? Pretty bad. Looks pretty bad. A wreath of parsley is what they got, or a wreath of pine needles. That was the perishable crown that the Olympic champions won. So we don't do what we do, subjecting our will to God's will, because we're going to get a perishable crown. It's an imperishable crown. It's one that's never going away. Yeah, exactly. Totally agree with that. (laughs) Let's go on. Um, Therefore, I run thus, not with uncertainty. Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air. What he's talking about is shadow boxing. That's the analogy he's using. I don't, I don't shadow box. I'm in this to win it. I'm not just shadow boxing. I'm not just playing. Thus I fight not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. I thought about this too, not only with respect to humbleness, subjecting our will to God's, but also when 1 Peter 5 talks about the, the uh, elders should be examples to the flock. You know, they should be the type, remember? They should be the imprint. They should be, this is what you want to do. This is what you want to look like. It's just like this. I, I don't, as, as somebody who is um, a Christian and striving to be a Christian, I don't want people to look at me and say, if he's a Christian, I don't want nothing to do with it. Are you kidding me? Because that's the other option. Now that's, and a lot of times that's happened in America. It absolutely has. Christians do no disrespect meant to anybody, really stupid stuff. And then what happens? Christianity is in disrepute. Jesus Christ is in disrepute because some Christian does something stupid, does something that's not Christian. So uh, the last thing I wanted to talk about uh, that's in First Peter chapter 5, is the devil. And with these first two things, just to you know, kind of a take-home sort of synopsis, um, with elders and with humbleness both as topics, the question I want you to just ask yourself is, what's the next step in discipleship for you? Now, this can be something as simple as, I'm going to read the Bible more. I'm going to financially give. I'm going to serve. I'm going to... Um, spend time with my family more to try to um, build my marriage or um, raise my kids in a more biblical manner. We're not talking about rocket science. We're not talking about you're going to go out and lead a megachurch. We're talking about the basic, daily, consistent Christian habits to become a disciple. Just like we saw with Simone Biles, a gymnast, had to do that for (laughs) I don't know how many years before she got to the point of the high-level stuff she does. We're not talking about rocket science. We're talking about basic stuff. For all of us, that's the truth. Let's look at the adversary. Um, one, one part, so the elders have really been, we're working on bylaws, as you know, and one part of our bylaws, which I think we got a comment about it, but one part of the bylaws says we believe in Satan. We're going to talk about that right now because First Peter chapter 5 talks about it. Let's get a running start on Satan, okay? Um, we're going to look at Isaiah chapter 14. And we're going to, um, we'll get a running start of Satan and sort of, sort of how he originated and some of what the Bible says about it. And this, uh, the word, uh, the devil, that's used in 1 Peter 5 is um, the Greek, a Greek word that means slanderer. He's a slanderer of believers. He essentially talks bad about them, and we'll see that too. Let's read Isaiah 14. How, and this is, um, this is actually addressed earlier in the chapter. It's addressed to the, to the king of Babylon. The reason I point that out is, so, so when Isaiah spoke this prophecy, 
It was addressed earlier to the king of Babylon, but we'll see here it's addressed to Lucifer too, so it has kind of a dual application. But when he spoke this prophecy, Isaiah, it was still about 75 years before Babylon became a world power, before the king of Babylon was a problem in the first place. In other words, it's 70 years before any of this stuff actually happened. And so it's prophetic from that respect. But what it's talking about with Lucifer is reflecting back on his beginnings, how he came about, so to speak. How are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How are you cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations? For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. So you see a fundamental, not only how he started, but the fundamental motivation. I'm going to be like God. I want to be like God. Interesting. What did he tell Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 3? You're going to be like God. Did God really say that? First thing he's always going to do is question God's word. Is God's word really true? Did God really say that? No, God didn't say that. He knows you're going to be like God. Prime motivation. It's what he wanted to do himself. He wanted to be the most high. So what's he going to do? You can be like God too. So those are some beginnings. Let's look on at uh, Luke chapter 4. This is, this, is in the, this is such an instructive scripture to me. Um, this happens in the record of the temptations of Christ in Luke 4 and Matthew 4. And this is, let, let's just read this. Let's just, this is the devil, and this is the only instance when, the, other than Job, when the devil and God have a face-to-face -face meeting and it talks about that. This is the only time the devil actually faces somebody, an individual face-to-face. -face. Doesn't happen otherwise. Then the devil, taking him, Jesus, up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, all this authority I will give you and their glory, for this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship before me, all will be yours. Now, a couple of things. You see another motivation of the devil. He wants worship. Why did he say the power was all his? Remember who was supposed to be, have dominion over the earth originally? Adam and Eve. What did Adam and Eve do? Disobeyed. Where did all that dominion go to? The devil. That's why he says it's his. Because it is. You'll notice, we don't, we're not going to read the subsequent verses, but Jesus doesn't say, you're wrong. He doesn't say that. He doesn't reprimand him. He doesn't say, no, you don't. That's not your power. He doesn't say that. Why? Because he knows it's true. That's why. <clears throat> but what does he say? And Jesus answered and said to him, Get behind me, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. So we see another motivation of the devils. We see that he does have the power of this world. We see that he also says, I give it to whomever I want. Let's read on in uh, 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. And because of what we, what we read in Luke here, this is why 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 can say, Whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. He's called the God of this world. Now, this is all relating to the devil. By the way, oh, golly, Joel, you reminded me. We've got to go over the memory verse because... Um, let's go over the memory verse now before I forget that. <laughs> look at, everybody, look at your Bibles, if you would, so we read this together. And I do encourage you to actually memorize these verses. I think it's, and if you, um, I will encourage you to consider doing this with your children. If you have kids, I would encourage you to consider memorizing Scripture with your children. Really encourage you to do that. Um, let's just read 1 Peter 5, uh, let's see, <clears throat> 6 and 7. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, 
that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. So I encourage you not only to memorize yourself, but also to memorize with your kids. If you don't already do that, I'm not telling you how to raise your kids, I just encourage you to consider that. So back to 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. He's called the God of this world because he is, little g, God of this world. Right? He is because of what we read in Luke chapter 4. He has the authority. That's true. He does. Jesus didn't reprimand him. Jesus said, you're not right about that. Let's go on and look at, and this is again just looking at the devil, what resisting the devil and what the devil really looks like. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. So when things contrary to God's purposes are being done in the world or people are doing them, please remember there is an orchestrator and the orchestrator is the devil, right? It's not, it's not left politics or right politics or conservative or um, liberal. It's not that. I mean, it, it may have those labels, but those are all just euphemisms What's behind this, what's behind accomplishing his purposes in the world versus God's purposes in the world is the devil. That's the, the backdrop here. All the other stuff is sort of smoke and mirrors. Let's go on to uh, Revelation chapter 12, verses 9 and 10. And again, this is just about the devil and what the Bible says about him. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren, that's the devil, who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. So the devil accuses the brother, the Christians. That's, his, that's what he does. That's his nature. That's what he's going to do. He wants to be like the Most High. He wants worship. He's going to tell you you're like God. Those are all things he's going to do. That's what the Bible says about him. And then uh, the last thing I want to do is um, read John 8, 44. This is what Jesus Christ himself thought about the devil. Okay? John 8, 44. And mind you, he's... Um, He's talking to the Pharisees here. And just, just think about this. The Pharisees were the ruling religious party. If any, they were instrumental in bringing about his crucifixion. The Pharisees were. He's talking to the Pharisees here. John 8, 44. You are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. He's talking to the Pharisees, guys. And that word murderer, it's just, it was an interesting kind of literal equivalent to me. The Greek word means man killer. Literally means man killer, which is exactly what the devil did with Adam and Eve. You shall not surely die. You're going to be like God. This is the devil that 1 Peter 5 talks about. Now, he's a powerful person, right? He's a powerful being. But <laughs> here's the thing. You, let's look at 1 John chapter 4, verse 4. <laughs> because without, without Jesus Christ, we wouldn't stand a chance against the devil, obviously. We would not stand a chance. But look at 1 John 4, 4. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Colossians chapter 1 talks about the fact that we have Christ in us. 1 Corinthians talks about the fact that if the devil had known that that crucifixion would have resulted in Christ being in every one of the believers, he never would have done it. That's how significant Christ in you is. That's how much that means. That's how much greater what's in you is than what's in the world. And I've heard this before with, in different preachers, but you, you, might, you may have heard it. You and God always make a majority. You and God always make a majority. It doesn't matter what the opposition is. We deal with a God who can do anything he wants to, whenever he wants to, 
wherever he wants to. So you and God always make a majority. And we read record after record after record after record like that in the Bible. You and God always make a majority. So greater is he that is in you. And when we sober, vigilant, you know, the, the roaring lion, you know, that roar for me might be ah, some trauma, some evil thing that happens to me that's very ungodly by someone else or by a family member, or it might be an illness that God doesn't desire in my life, and all of a sudden it's a serious illness. Um, that roar that can kind of freeze us and make us think that the devil has power, it can be any one of those things, but it's always greater is he than you, that is in you than he that is in the world. I mean, it's just when we encounter a situation, what's bigger, the situation or God? Is my God big enough? If my God isn't big enough, I'm the one that has the problem, not God. I'm the one that needs to change my attitude, not God. He hasn't changed. I have. And I need to change my opinion. So God and you always make a majority. And it's just, uh, when we read, you know, it's going back to the bylaws thing. The reason we put the, we believe that Satan is a real being in there is because of John 8, 44. <laughs> because that's what Jesus said. Because he characterized him and what he's like. Because he is a man killer. Because he's the father of lies. Because he's really there. Because he's our adversary. So he's definitely there. We need to recognize that he's the adversary. At the same time, recognizing that Christ in us is greater than that. Because of what God did in Christ, if the devil had known it, he wouldn't have done the crucifixion at all. He wouldn't have, it says he wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory if he had known what it would result in. That's how great what God put in you, in me, really is. So if you, um, I want to take a minute and give everybody an opportunity to start that relationship with Jesus Christ if you haven't. If you have started that relationship with Jesus Christ, I think one of the great take-homes of 1 Peter chapter 5 is what's the next step? What's the next step? Again, it doesn't have to be complicated. Read the Bible more. Memorize the scripture. Develop my God relationship with my spouse. Raise my children more in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Financially give when I maybe haven't done that. Serve in some way. Whatever it is. For you, God is an individual God. He's going to work with you. He's going to work in you to willing to do of his good pleasure. I just encourage you to consider that. And again, would you pray with me, whether you have come to a knowledge of Christ or you have not. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I apologize for disobeying you. And I thank you for forgiving me by what Jesus did. I confess that Jesus is the Lord of my life. And I believe you raised him from the dead. I ask that you give me the strength to be an example of a follower of Jesus every day of my life. Heavenly Father, thank you for your goodness. We thank you for <clears throat> our time together. Um, I again ask that you just work in all of us to actually learn what you want us to learn. But we so thank you for your grace, for your goodness, for giving us Christ in us that's greater than he that is in the world. Thank you so much, and uh, again, thank you for today. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of his precious Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. God bless you. Thank you.